Um, so, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to those of you that have tuned in for today's fireside chat. Uh, depending on uh, what part of the world you're joining from, welcome. Uh, last week, we kicked off a virtual event series with an all-star panel um, discussion featuring added manufacturing leaders from Siemens, Dana, Worth, Festus. And today's session is a continuation of a series of supply chain optimization events uh, we're hosting this quarter. So uh, my name is Mike Cady. Uh, I'm a director here with Mark Forged leading both sales and channel across uh, North America territories in Latin America. And I've been with the company for about two and a half years and have been working directly um, with today's special guest uh, from the moment I walked in the door at Mark Forged uh, in June of 2018. So um, we'll be discussing today Dana's uh, strategic approach to additive manufacturing, best practices and learnings uh, from this transformational journey and how Dana uh, is successfully weaving additive skill sets and processes into the cultural fabric of their of their worldwide organization, um, and it's you know with pleasure and an absolute honor that uh, I've been chosen to lead today's chat with uh, the current vice president of Dana's uh, light vehicle uh, drive systems engineering group, Terry Hammer. Terry, welcome. Hey, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Yeah, man, it's great to see you and uh, appreciate you joining us today. So I, I kind of like to start, Terry, uh, by kicking things off today, talking about you. So okay. uh, I, I guess first off, and, and I mean this when I say it, you're one of the most um, impactful and well-respected corporate leaders I've had the honor of working with over the last 20 years. I've got a lot of respect for you, how you work how you communicate, how you lead people. Um, and, and, and I'd like you to maybe just kick off a little bit and take a few moments and introduce yourself. Yeah, sure, no problem. Your experiences over the last 35 years in, in automotive. Yeah, guys, uh, good morning and, and thanks again for your time. I have uh, I've been in automotive for uh, almost 35 years now. I started off working with uh, Ford um, and then moved to Dana in 94. I've been with Dana for a long time. I really started off on the ground floor. Um, I was a uh, line operator at the plant and then uh, moved into the engineering field and worked my way up from uh, entry level engineer to the vice president role. So it was uh, um, a wonderful journey. I. I I really believe that a lot of my style comes from the fact that uh, I started on the ground floor, um, work with the guys in the line. I I learned from the guys in the line, I should say, really, because that's really what happened. Uh, um, I uh, I learned to buy a lot of cups of coffee for the the old guys, and and they taught me what I needed to know to make sure I was successful at Dana. So. Um, Dana is uh, um, an old company, 115 years old now. Um, we're making uh, axles, prop shafts, and transmissions. Um, you'll hear the word Dana Spicer. Um, Spicer, um, Clarence Spicer, was actually the, the guy with the invention of the universal joint. So uh, really Dana started from an engineering background with a, uh, a strong history in, in, engine, um, in engineering patents uh, technology. We have over 11,000 active patents right now. So uh, um, great place to work. Um, again, it, it is very automotive focused. Um, we do have uh, divisions that uh, um, are also in the off-highway market and the commercial vehicle market. I'm, I run the light vehicle business unit. Um, before this, I was uh, vice president of global manufacturing. And really that's how I got into the additive journey in the role for global manufacturing. Really looking at the uh, digital transformation in the industry. Um, it really started with uh, Dana's initiative to what we call Industry 4.0. I think most guys in the industry understand what that is. It's really connecting people um, from to the digital world um, and connecting equipment to the digital world. Um, and really, to be honest, uh, um, Additive became a piece of the digital transformation. And that's really how we uh, I'll say kicked off the additive mindset was really 
due to the fact that uh, um, whenever you're talking, taking, so to speak, uh, um, digital or CAD data and transforming it into actual product, additive manufacturing is the simplistic version of that, right? It is simply CAD data straight to part. So um, definitely a part of our industry 4.0 transformation at Dana. I got the privilege of leading that for a couple of years and, and got to bring additive into the, the fold with that. So I hope that was a, a good enough intro there, Mike. Yeah, it was a great, it was a great intro. And, um, you know, so look, Dana's a, Dana's a fortune 500 global leader, right? You're, um, uh, you guys have what, roughly 36, 36, 37,000 employees, um, 150 facilities globally. So, you know, Dana has been around for a long time and you don't, and you don't, um, remain in business for a long, a long time. If you're, if you're not always pushing the envelope and trying to stay ahead. Right. And, um, Dana talks about, um, you know, how they've always led the charge in this space. And, um, you know, you've proven time and time again, that, uh, you know, you not only involve in tandem, you know, with the industry, but, but, but you always remain a step ahead. What I'd like you to do, Terry, is, uh, for the audience that's on the phone, like, um, talk a little bit about, you know, describe your thoughts and opinions around, um, you know, why added manufacturing is integral to the manufacturing life cycle and, um, a well-functioning supply chain. Like what are the, like at the, at the business level, what do you see as the overall key benefits of additive? Yeah, sure. You know, um, truly additive has been a part of Dana before I even started. Uh, it was the very old systems, right? It was, we were making parts from paper. Um, whenever I started in 94, it was layered paper that was laser cut. And basically what we did there, we took those paper models and did very much so, I'll say, we turned it into tooling for castings, but we also did the, the base fit form and function checks with paper models back in the day. Obviously it was a, a, you know, a non-functional part, um, but the same value was there even back in, in 94 when I started with Dana. Um, and then we've been, I'll say, so to speak, on the additive journey ever since I've, I've been with Dana. The, uh, the real difference uh, came down to Really, whenever we switch from, I'll say, non-functional parts into the ability for additive to actually make functional parts, right? Um, or um, tooling fixtures that had real life, right? They weren't paper. Now I have onyx, carbon fiber reinforced plastics. I have various options in metal. And the and to be honest, the, the cost of entry significantly changed in order to buy the equipment that can make that. So... It, it was really um, ingrained in Dana before I got there from a basic fundamental standpoint. But the real change was, hey, I'm not using it just as an engineering tool. Now it can be transformed into something that can really um, be used on the shop floor, be used in the customer um, vehicle or customer prototype area. So it became more of a, instead of a, just a fit form and function, um, check to, hey, a truly functional part um, from a journey standpoint. So um, we actually, uh, um, we started with Mark Forge in our journey in about 2017. Um, the, uh, before that, we had done a, uh, a study in 2015, looking at the technologies and the cost for capital and the ability to make functional parts. And we really said at that time um, in 2015, let's pause, let's wait. The technology trend is moving very fast right now. If we buy a piece of equipment today, and um, we will probably um, need to replace it very quickly because the technology is going to be um, uh, extinct, much like the iPhones, right? You had the four, five, six, seven, so on and so forth. Um, the, the thought was in 2015, that if we bought the additive equipment that was available in the market, then we would be, I'll say jumping a little bit early. We, um, and really, I truly think we were probably right. Cause, uh, really the cost for 
entry into the capital equipment at that time was around a million and a half a machine. Most of them were powder bed. Most of them had significant safety risk associated with them. Um, so it was not the right time to enter the market. And really Mark Forge transformed both the, the cost for entry, you know, to drop the cost to roughly a tenth, so to speak, to buy a X7 and a, a Metal X combo. You could do it for roughly a, a tenth of the price of, of what we were looking at in 2015. Um, and then also the material availability was there. Um, and then the third piece was the safety piece of it. You didn't have to worry about the, the safety concerns you have to worry about with powder bed and, and I'll say small particle um, uh, inhalation risk for the operator. So we've been focused on additive for a long time but the real value came by watching technology trends and deciding when the right time was to invest and to be fair, who the right partner was to invest with based upon cost of capital, um, I'll say equipment uptime, ability to deliver based on print bed size, functional material availability, um, and, and it was just, uh, I'll say, make it simple, it was a, a great partnership that was formed um, with the generation of, of the Mark Forge equipment. Yeah, and that's, and that's so there's a couple of things you said, Terry, that I'd like to pull on a little bit. So um, at Mark Forge, we talk about um, the digital forge platform. And when we say platform, it's the ecosystem of the hardware, the software, and the materials. And the impediment in 2015 for you, right, pre-Mark Forge, um, is that you were looking at hardware investments. Um, but I, I believe, or would you agree, like in this journey that we've been on, is we innovate through software, right? So not only is the investment 110, but we get to, you get to maintain that hardware platform as capabilities are released. They're released through our cloud first software platform. And you get to take advantage of those live, right? With every net new update, we push to the cloud, the end customer gets that value uh, um, in, in our software, right? And I, I think there's a lot to be said about that. Um, in yeah, in the end, you're, you're really hitting the ease of implementation, right? Uh, I mean, the the uh, uh, Mark Ford system is take your CAD data, plug it into iGear and hit print. I mean, that may sound a little simplistic, but it is almost that, that simple. You have the ability, of course, to change layer resolution, material type, so on and so forth. But uh, um, the ease of uh, A, um, I'll say on the metal side, obviously, the centering um, technology and not having to worry about the part deformation because Mark Forged already did that in the software. It auto correct, so to speak. So all I got to do still is just input my CAD and I still get the end part that I want. So that was um, not having to understand um, material potential movements um, through the centering process um, was huge in the ability to jump into the, uh, the Metal X. Um, the, uh, obviously many people are out there still selling powder beds that don't have centering technology available. So the centering technology and that ease of implementation and that, uh, um, I'll say, simple digital step of CAD data into program hit print um, was a great enabler. And like you said, everybody is uh, um, looking at software. I mean, when I started at Dana, um, we made, uh, you know, simply axles, drive shafts, um, very, very limited um, uh, integration to the vehicle from a electronic standpoint. Now you have traction assist, you have um, stability and traction control, you have electronic locking diffs, you have disconnecting axles to increase efficiency on the highway. Um, and then of course the movement towards the electrified driveline and the really the, the need to make a smarter product to make it as efficient as possible, given the driving conditions or whatever, um, it, it's kind of mirrors the, where everything's going, right? You got smart houses, you got smart cars, and you got smart manufacturing. Everything is being affected by the digital revolution or the, 
the software. You know, I mean, in the end, it takes software to make it all run, but yeah. it all hooks, hooks together there. And what? So that that's in that's an interesting point, right? So um, one of the one of the challenges I see Terry personally in the industry is um, we got a lot of customers or potential customers out there that are looking at what I, what I call the back of the brochure, and they're looking at speeds and feeds, and they're missing. It's your point, the partnership conversation, they're missing the platform conversation. Um, like for example, like right on board on the X7, you've got that laser micrometer. We continue to release functionality, right? That's IOT based functionality is an outcome of that laser micrometer that's on board. So the, the, the system continues to get smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter and brings additional value to the customer, very similar to that scenario you just walked through in the automotive industry. Um, so kind of like, um, you know, if to, to the audience on the phone, Terry, like if you had any advice, guidance and counsel uh, for those that are out there that are thinking, you know, hey, we're ready to dip our toe in the water or man, we, we, we know there's, there's large value here. We, we, don't, we don't know where to start. Like what, what just general advice, guidance, and counsel would you, would you give the audience on the phone about, you know, hey, <laughs> here's Terry's view of the world and how to get started. Well, in the end, uh, um, it's always uh, um, tough to, to change. Uh, I think we've got a 115-year-old industry, at, at least at our company at my place. And to get the mindset to change um, is the number one inhibitor to, I'll say, making anything successful within a large organization. So it, it really came from, A, the, the top management understood the value proposal. Um, they seen that the, the technology was the right time for entry. Um, and they knew if we didn't enter, we were going to also, to, so to speak, be missing a tool to make us the most efficient uh, um, we can be to drive value to our OEM. So um, the, the value statement, as much as it was perceived and not necessarily on paper at the time, um, up front was um, top level engagement help drive. And we did a very nice job of, of what we did um, we took uh, a cross-functional group of, of manufacturing, purchasing, human resources, um, um, operators, engineers, and we said, okay, we're going to take, and it was roughly uh, about 35, 40 people from each of the various functions um, and brought them into teams. and. We gave them all a project assignment. We looked at everything. Um, we looked at the basic value streams, the prototyping, the tooling and fixture side, and, and then the actual end product side. Um, and we gave them particular items and said, I want you to go um, and challenge yourself to make it with an additive and see what value statements you can bring back to the organization. So. The, the real the real drive was twofold with that process. It was a um, we got to get information, so to speak, in the hands of the guys that are that are really doing work every day. So it was education, and the the thought of them understanding um, the I'll say I'll say it this way again. It's quite simple to make a part with the additive uh, um, process today. Um, so it was take the fear away, give them education, let them for themselves experience the potential value and ease of, of making a product. And, and then we took some of the constraints off, said, okay, here's your, here's your beginning project. Um, they got the opportunity to come back, present to the ELT, talk about their value statements, make sure that that message was, was working so to speak, both uh, from their voice back to the ELT and the ELT's voice to them. And then we gave them the freedom to, okay, now, now that you understand the technology a bit, tell me where you think you can provide the most value using the technology and come back and do another project. So in the end, um, it was, 
I'll say taking high potential people, giving them an opportunity and giving them visibility to the executive leadership team through that opportunity. And it was all about taking away the fear and driving education in the organization and letting people that, so to speak, are, are on the shop floor, I'll say it that way, or um, find value in the organization with the process. So uh, I, you're never going to, in my opinion, as a, um, a real leadership team, you're never going to see the same type of value sitting in the, in the conference room as the guy does on the floor, period. Um, I mean, we solve some, some what we would think would be very simplistic problems on the assembly line or the, or the uh, machining line because the operator was, I have this problem every day. And if I change the way this looked, then it makes my job easier every day. And additive enabled that, oh, I couldn't make it that way before, but now I can make it this way tomorrow. Um, it makes his job easier, makes, uh, I'll say, so to speak, the plant OEE improve. Um, and the values start popping as people saw the opportunity to do things differently. So it, it comes, in my opinion, with A, um, leadership vision, and B, education. And, and see the opportunity to take that education to the guys that are really gonna use the technology. Uh, uh, there, there is a lot to unpack there, Mr. Hammond. <laughs> uh, having, having been alongside you uh, on this journey, um, look, I, I, I think some of the things that, that Dana did, did right, right? Um, look, what you just walked through is what I would call a, a program framework, right? That you guys followed, like a methodology on how to tackle additive. And it's, it, it's more people process focused than technology focused. You know, sure. one of the things I talk to my teams uh, about regularly, and, and, and if any of them are on the, phone, on the uh, line today, uh, I always talk about hope is not a strategy right? You've got to have a plan. You got to work your plan. You got to execute. So I think this is one of the clear differentiators behind Dana's success or early success, I'd say, in building out your additive program. Um, we oftentimes see companies, Terry, um, you know, heavily focused on the technology, looking for a problem. You guys took a different approach, right? And, and this is what impresses me most. Dana started with the business problem. Right, you got you guys set out and said, "What are the problems we're trying to solve? What is the value at stake?" Remember how many nights we were up plugging away in spreadsheets, looking at, you know, yeah, yeah right. Like, <laughs> there, we found another fifty million. Right, like it's uh, that there, there was um, um, you know, we spent time focusing on the addressable market within the data enterprise, and then the role added manufacturing would play in solving that problem. And because we did that, right, it further reinforced the executive buy-in. And that's kind of what you just walked through is like being able to spend time on the business case opportunity, getting sponsorship from, you know, the leadership team, and then get also getting down right from plant floor all the way up the chain, right? Getting a functional, call it, you know, steering committee or support of sponsors engaged is really what... Um, I think set you guys apart from many organizations we see and we work with um, is there was a plan, right? You had sponsorship, you're involved in the plant um, and, and there's a lot to be said about that. Um, you also, um, you know, and I, I use this quote often from Deloitte, success, and they say successfully implementing and scaling AM technology to an industrial level or even determine whether it's economically justifiable um, often requires organizations to consider factors beyond the additive manufacturing machinery, right? So um, you just walked us through, right? You, not one time in there did we talk about printers. You talked about people and process and learning and education, right? And, I, and, and would you agree that's like, it, you know, one of the key messages to, to this audience that's, that's joined us today is like focus on the, people process people. Yeah, you know, it, it, 
I, I would say it maybe a little differently, but, but very much the same way, right? Before the tool was super expensive. When I talked about 2015, it was a million and a half to buy the tool. And then the tool became, I'll say cheap enough that it wasn't about the tool anymore. It was about the, the education of the people to utilize the tool the right way um, and making sure that tool was in their hands. So, and really, it, it was that transformation, um, the, the technology, so to speak, caught up with the, uh, the cost model. And then it, you know, it's not about the equipment anymore. This is about driving value into the organization. And you don't drive value with uh, just buying the tool. You have to do it with the people and the integration of the tool. So... The tool came at the right price, and then it was, okay, do you know how to use it? And is it, so to speak, at your fingertips whenever you need it? Um, it was that simple. Um, it, it, I make it simple and buy it down to that. But, it, you know, it, it does take work. I mean, you don't, you don't just uh, buy the printer and, and um, roll it out there and, and say, go at it, guys. It, it takes that. Um, well, to be fair, um, we were with Mark Fors in the very beginning, and we helped uh, drive Mark Fors University quite a bit. Um, it was an opportunity to, hey, we called it, uh, we want our pilots to get our wings, is what we said. So um, we really, again, it's about education and, and how do you use it? How do you drive value from it? What are the design guidelines around it? How do you go out on the floor and find value with it? Um, so it, it was a, a fun journey, I'll say, helping um, shape Mark Forge University, at least what we could and, and how we perceived what we needed for Dana. And of course, to be fair, um, Drew um, jumped in and, and, and ran with it from there, right? Uh, um, for those who don't know, Drew's also known as Sleeves because he's tattooed. <laughs> <laughs> Painted sleeves, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and what was my nickname? I had a nickname. I was the Candyman. 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 That's, right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, so partnership selection, right? I've heard you say it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And you know me well enough. Like I've had this conversation with you before. I think too many people out too many people out there today throw the word partnership around what we've developed, like we've developed, and I'm, I'll say this friendship and a partnership, right? Bet between the logos, right? And the people yeah. between the logos. Um, you know, I'm excited. Mark Forge University is now online. We're now doing online certifications, right? We do it on premise. We do it in Boston. We, we wouldn't be there without you guys, right? And, um, you know, and I think a lot of the innovation that's come out of Mark Forge, um, from a, a enterprise software perspective, you guys help drive that, right? Sure. Um, you know, it, there's a lot to be said about partnership. Um, can you can you spend some time um, talking about like it, the current state of Dana from an additive perspective? I.e., you know, we've got roughly investment of 25 plus machines in four uh, continents. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, sure. the knowledge from Dana, we've built software that's played into your factory, Ford Auto Strategy, MES integration, et cetera. Can you, can you unwind that a little bit and, and talk just about the partnership and, and how important that is in, a, in, in what I would say accelerating um, additive adoption? Well, I'll, I'll reinforce that the partnership was as much as anything in the beginning, right? Uh, um, without uh, the, um, the mentality that we were truly in this together, we never would have got through everything we got through. So right. the partnership was, was um, drove the organization. And I will say, um, you know, from the Mark Ford side, uh, um, it came from Greg down, right? Uh, um, he was uh, he was engaged, uh, available, um, saw the value. Um, it, it was uh, amazing, I'll say, so to speak, how the uh, the partnership just kept growing. 
Um, and and I, maybe some of it is, um, no, I'll be frank, Greg's an engineer and so am I, which never hurts, right? Uh, two engineers right. can speak the same language really easy. And, and of course, for those who don't know, Mike came from a, a software background. So uh, um, before we leave, Mike, you have to tell why you left uh, um, your software company and came to Mark Forge. I think that's a unique point that the, everybody should hear. But uh, really, um, in the end, it was, um, we brought a, a very um, old auto automotive mindset um, that was, I'll say, heavy manufacturing based company that was very open to, we know the digital transformation is important. We have to be on the edge of that digital transformation. And um, so our mindset was moving in the right direction. And, and to be fair, um, the, the Mark Forge team was uh, um, growing at a rapid rate. Um, and I'll say very flexible and fast, which, which made, um, I'll say both of our, our lives, uh, easy, so to speak, to go quick together, find ways to grow, um, whether it was the, the software side or the equipment side or the project side. I mean, I don't know how many parts you guys printed for us, uh, early in the, the journey, but uh, um, obviously you guys helped us prototype, you guys helped us learn, um, you guys helped us uh, understand, hey, we couldn't get this part to look the way we wanted it when we printed it, what would we do wrong? So that value of uh, your hotline, so to speak, support um, was huge also on the, uh, I'm, I'm doing something wrong or, or the, the filament wire broke and I don't know how to replace it or whatever it was, so. Um, it, it, it was a line, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it would just call Mike and tell him to fix it. <laughs> right. Then I call the TNT outline, right? You got it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, um, I think I got off some of your questions there a little bit, but uh, I know you were, you know, talking about uh, the digital transformation. Um, in the end, the, the I'll say, um, we got the mindset of being able to um, uh, attach Dana's standard, what we call our backbone of our um, MES system, manufacturing execution system, right into the Mark Forged equipment. So I can actually retrieve a birth certificate for every part that comes off of the printer, right? Um, we have the ability, of course, with the, um, I'll say the, uh, um, the connected technology of being able to print from anywhere in the world to any of our printers in the world. Um, and at the same time, we also have the ability to say, hey, I know I got to have restrictions to make sure that uh, people don't do the, the wrong things because they still have to produce a quality part. So we were able to also layer in safeties. So we had I'll say the big group and the subgroups and even the smaller groups in order for having rev control on products so on and so forth than the software. So it was from a, um, you know, from a beginning standpoint of a, a very open system to um, uh, being able to fully connect to it for track and trace or birth certificate history, as well as um, an enterprise network to be able to see all your printers in your fleet, be able to control those printers in the fleet, and then the quality mindset of, hey, I gotta be able to make sure I'm printing the right product everywhere. So um, in the end, all of those pieces on the software side of, of Mark Forge um, popped in very heavily. Um, and we were able to drive value with it. The uh, We started off uh, with a largely a, a European and North America model um, so our first printers were in Europe and, and North America with uh, the Mark Forge printers. And, and then we started just because of the ability to create value with them quite easily. Um, and then we started expansion. So now we have North America, um, South America covered, 
Um, we have a uh, um, couple sites in, in Europe covered now. We have uh, India and, and China coming online. Um, so we're really, we uh, um, made sure that we had, I'll say, additive equipment setting globally around the world where Dana does business, a simple way to say it. Yep. So not to sound cliche here, but if anybody knows Dana, the, the tagline is people finding a better way, right? And uh, we're, we're doing that together. Um, so I think there's an even, and there, there's an, and I'll look for input from you here, Terry, but uh, for the audience that's uh, listening, look, uh, you know, there's operator training for technology, right, in this space. And then there's, um, you know, I mentioned as I, as I opened up today, right, kind of like infusing additive into the cultural fabric of Dana, right? That, that, that was something that you pushed from day one. Um, can, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because, um, you know, operator training, yeah, you know how to replace materials, you can print a part. But for, you know, true like digital transformation and organizational like change to be prepared is what I'll call, because we know where this journey is going, right? The journey, the, the vision is mass production and parts, right? Yep. But the organization from cooling engineer to ME on the floor to manager back at corporate to new product development team like there is a mindset and a skill set of designing for additive throughout the entire ideation to um, production to maintain process of manufacturing that 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 has to be in the bloodline of the organization um, so that you're positioned when that happens you're a utility right and then you go and that's your competitive differentiator can you maybe unpack that a little bit and talk a little bit more about um, kind of what that, you know, where that education has gone throughout, you know, Dana and how you guys are looking at, um, you know, designing for additive and, and all that good stuff, right? Um, in the yeah, in, in, yeah, in the end, uh, uh, you know, uh, my big push was, um, and the, from the very beginning, it was if you don't design a product with an additive mindset, you're so to speak, uh, you're missing the boat up front. Uh, so it, it was um, really about how do I take the technology, understand its performance, um, and I mean by performance, that's in product performance, not necessarily equipment performance. So I'm talking about does the uh, um, the technology marry with the uh, um, the end user needs the guy on the car and, and driving down the highway. That's what you know. That's where my brain is. So it was um, ensuring that the um, we understood the the part to part variation, whether that's uh, print to print, so to speak, off the equipment, or machine to machine variation. Or, um, in other words, is every piece of equipment making the exact same part? Um, and then, of course, okay, what do I know about the incoming material? Um, and that would be the, uh, um, I'll say, strand to strand variation potential in the incoming material making that part. So it's product life is about uh, um, understanding um, the fatigue characteristics of what you're making and being able then to design around it. So as much as we talked about the operator side and we talked about the, um, the uh, ability to go down the shop floor and find value statements, in the end, if you're not designing for additive and you don't look at this as a um, uh, a technology that just like whether it's a forging or a casting or or a, um, an other type of centered metal product, if you don't understand the variation in the process and the product, you can't actually design for it and you can't convince the OEM you're going to put it in the vehicle safely and I'm not going to hurt somebody because something breaks going down the highway. So um, for me, um, as much as the 
I know I got to know how to operate the equipment. I got to make sure that equipment's making a product that, that um, I understand the, the quality signature or the birth certificate record of it. It was about making sure the engineers had the ability to understand the fatigue characteristics, so to speak, so I can design with it and make product with it. I don't know if I answered your question exactly what you're looking for, Mike, but uh, um, in the end, uh, I, I've always said that if, uh, if you can't um, uh, predict life, I can't sell it to the OEM. And that's yeah. what it boils down to. Understood. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes left and I've been asked to leave about 10 minutes for Q and A. Um, so a couple, couple last questions before we get there. Um, you haven't answered my question yet. What made you switch from software <laughs> to additive? All right. I think it's an important, you know, in, in the end, you know, to hear that where the value of making a person, um, where do they perceive value? You're hearing how I perceive value. So uh, how did you perceive value? So that's, that's fair. I thought I was supposed to be the one asking the questions, Terry, come on. Uh, <laughs> so, so look, I was, uh, for those of, for the audience on the phone, uh, prior to coming to Mark Fords, I spent um, about 18 years in high tech, um, uh, both hardware, software, public sector, federal government, global enterprise, um, as a, as a digi digital transformation guy, right? That's what I did for, for a career. And, uh, you know, sometimes in life we stumble upon things that uh, just grab our attention. And um, a former colleague of mine at lunch with me pulls out a metal brake lever for that, for the Ducati, right? And, and he puts it on a table and I'm like, what's that? And he's like, I printed that. And I'm like, what do you mean you printed it? And uh, we started talking and I, I'm holding this thing in my hand, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like the coolest thing I've ever seen. Tell me more, right? So three months later, I'm like getting off an airplane in uh, Boston and I'm uh, walking to Mark Ford's headquarters for, <laughs> for, uh, for an interview. And uh, next thing you know, I, uh, I left this, uh, this uh, a, a really good situation in the high tech world to uh, frankly, come to Mark Forge and be a part of something, right? Be a part of not only the the industry mission, right? Which for those of you that are keeping score at home, right? The industry is set to grow 11 times over the next 10 years, right? And if we look at, um, you know, what 5% of the global market would be, right? It, we're positioned to be a $640 billion industry. So the the, the opportunity here. Uh, to be a part of Mark Forged, right? This innovation growth engine and, and, and be able to look at the person on the right and the left every day and be on a mission. That was really attractive, right? And, and to get into something that was uh, truly like transformative. I mean, again, you're holding that part in your hand and you're just like, right, wow, right? And, and uh, it was, I can't believe how easy of a decision it was. And it was the best decision I've ever made. Um, and, uh, and I've been able to grow my career here inside of Mark Forge, which is something that I, you know, aspire to do big things here. And uh, I've had the uh, luxury of working with great people like you, Terry. I mean, it's it's been an awesome ride. And uh, I hope- uh, I was just pushing for your answer there because it, it, it goes whenever somebody leaves a rich history and does something new, it goes to that idea of I saw value, at least for me, right? Uh, yep. um, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't leave Dana unless somebody said, hey, look at this. This is super, super cool. And um, hey, I see that's going to be fun and it's going to drive value to the organization and allow for growth. And obviously you saw that. And, and uh, I think it goes a lot to say um, why additive is important because it's about people really seeing and looking uh, past some of the hurdles that uh, um, exist in the industry and say, hey, this is going to make a difference. This is going to be a game changer. Uh, and, and, and I think that's the, the um, in the end, that's what additive is about. So I wanted to push you to make that comment. All right. That's all right. I'm used to it. All right. So here <laughs> it is. Before we go to Q&A, Terry, what's your most memorable moment or moments from, from this overall relationship? the defined partnership for you? 
You know, um, whenever we had our the end of our our first round of projects, um, the 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 idea of partnership came through because it wasn't just Dana employees, the the team leaders that were leading those projects, uh, presenting to our executive leadership. Mark Forge actually came along. Um, I, I I've seen that uh, you know maybe a handful of times ever in my. Um, career at, uh, at Dana where um, we're bringing the supply base in, um, standing along beside the, the Dana leadership and, and presenting to our ELT and saying, hey, uh, um, A, we became a team, which was huge, and, and B, we see value. So um, it was, uh, in my opinion, the most miserable moment was, uh, was doing it together to our leadership um don't maybe the, i'd say the other piece is whenever you whenever they were still at the the water street address uh whenever you'd walk into the building and there were um they were bursting at the seams from growth and everybody was uh so to speak uh um finding anywhere they could sit to get their job done and and continue to work that that was something else that was nice to see it was truly a a work atmosphere um, that uh, allowed people to be innovative um, and creative and the people were all real excited about being at work. So those would have been the two things that uh, would have been the most important for me. Um, true partnership all the way up to the executive level and uh, and then the, the mentality that the people at Mark Forged were um, engaged and uh, enjoying their job and driving innovation. So, so you're telling me we can drive transformation and have a little fun too. You got it. All right, man. I like it. Being All right. Any, fan. <laughs> Terry, um, any other questions for me before we go to, uh, go to some Q and a, um, no, uh, you know, um, when's the next material going to be ready? And, and when's the next machine generation coming? <laughs> but that, I always ask you that, right? <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. And we, we, we tend to answer too, don't we? <laughs> yeah. You got to push technology, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, look, Terry, uh, it's been, uh, as always, um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, you know, this COVID thing hasn't been uh, the best thing to uh, connect people, but uh, it's great to see your face. I look forward to uh, to seeing you here in the coming weeks. I'm going to be up your way. Let's uh, try and make it a point to get together. And uh, if it's all right with you, let's go to, go to some Q&A. Yeah, sure. See if we got any Q&A. Looks like uh, there's a couple uh, of them out there that have been posted to the web, Mike. Uh, yeah. um, Sean O'Connell asked, uh, what is the approximate cost now? I'm assuming he's talking about the uh, the cost for the equipment. Um, you wanna take that yeah. rather than me guess what your equipment costs? Yeah, is there? <laughs> yeah sure. Um, Sean, look, we have, uh, we have a pretty wide uh, range in our printer portfolio from uh, desktop to professional series to industrial series to metal uh, that span from, you know, 4,500 bucks to uh, 180 K. Um, now that's for the hardware investment only. Um, you heard Terry and I talk a lot about people and process today. Um, please, please, please. If you're getting into, um, you know, into this space, um, make sure you're looking at uh, support uh, around your investment. Make sure you're looking at, operator training, make sure you're looking at um, education and curriculum for additive, right? So it's, it's not just the investment in the technology. Um, I would say more important, importantly, um, you know, make sure you have a strong plan around education and enablement. Um, not, not sure what your situation is, but uh, hopefully that answers, uh, answers your question and gives you some good context. And you can always reach out to Mark Forged at uh, markforged.com and um, uh, we've got an online chat bot there and we can get right back to you. So we have a, another question. Um, if you had to do it over again, what would you do differently? Um, and I, I guess from both sides, I think we can answer that, but uh, I'll be honest. Uh, um, if I was going to um, 
restart. I would have uh, improved communication. Um, Dana is a big company, um, and it's, it's always difficult to um, to get the message um, out to drive value as fast as you can. Um, and um, communication um, is is key to um, being able to reach all areas in the in the uh, um, company to help drive that value. So um, I would have probably um, may sound a little crazy. I probably would have put more marketing people on the teams up front and given them the task to not necessarily work on the projects, but work on the communication. Um, so that way we could have, uh, um, I'll say, done a internal commercial, so to speak, um, that uh, would reach more areas of the uh, uh, of the company from a value statement standpoint. To and, and in the end, that just drives the the return on your investment faster. So um, communication um, in order to reach uh, a to Z in the company would be my biggest change. Thanks, Terry. Um, Todd Grimm has a question. Can you clarify if the prime end use application is tooling or a blend of tooling and production parts? Um, if the latter applies, what types of parts have you successfully um, deployed? That's yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. In the end, uh, um, we have uh, um, used for end use parts, we have um, done that on the aftermarket side of the business. Um, in the end, we're running some uh, uh, pretty high volume scenarios on most of the parts we make. Um, so the, you know, it, in my opinion, if you're talking more than a thousand pieces a year, additive probably isn't fast enough yet to, to make the, uh, um, the part with a, a real cost return. So it is, there's this, um, the same mentality of how big of a part you're making. In other words, does it fit on the print bed? You have the second question of what's the um, material cost going into it? Uh, I mean, if it's a, a super low grade steel versus uh, um, a high cost material, that value changes significantly um, from a do you print it or not? Um, then, then it becomes the third question is, is how many do you need to make? So um, we have made parts for end item users for the aftermarket world because the volume scenarios were right. Um, there is huge opportunity in the tooling and fixture side. Um, whenever you're, I'll say, so heavy into manufacturing, obviously tooling, fixtures, engaging, um, all become part of the uh, um, value statement uh, for additive. Um, it'd be, I'll, a quick example. Um, we made some check fixtures um, and all we really did was with the additive equipment, make the nest that held the part and then it still went on the CMM. But because we were able to support the part um, so much better um, with a, I'll say a mirror image geometry, we we're able to improve the r and &R resolution or the gauge r and &R repeatability and reliability um, of the CMM significantly with a complex part. So there, there are, you got to be creative with additive and you got to make sure you're not uh, putting yourself, so to speak, in a box um, from a mindset standpoint. And you can find value, whether it's end item parts, um, prototype parts, or the tooling and fixture side. We have, we have submitted several um, prototype parts that are in um, durability vehicles to, again, push that, I understand life fatigue requirement, so it's safe to put it on the road, on the highway. Hope I answered that okay. Uh, let's, uh, so we've got probably, what, one, two, three, we've got about seven or eight uh, additional questions here in the chat with two minutes to go. Um, let's, uh, why don't we do this? Um, Terry, let's pick one. Uh, let's ready, aim, fire, answer. And then what we'll do is we'll screenshot and capture um, the remainder of these um, and, and address these offline. 
Um, sorry to the folks if we, we can't get to all your questions today, uh, but we, we will follow up as best we can. Um, let me see, let me find one here. Uh, what do you think, Terry? What one? What one single? I don't know. I, I got Steve Ross here, or Rose, sorry, in front of me. In your view, what has been is the biggest opportunity metal desktop AM brings to designers? Um, I mean, opportunity in AM is is, in my opinion, driven um, largely by the flexibility, the fact that. Uh, um, I mean, we haven't talked about the light weighting potential because of hollow infill, right? Uh, um, whenever you're truly doing, I'll say, weight optimization type um, uh, activities, weight optimization um, through hollow structure, of course, is, is simple and easy to understand by anybody. Um, again, it just goes back to, do I understand the end use part? and they take mass out in the right areas so it still performs. Um, so, it, and in the end, um, really it goes back to um, the flexibility and the idea that you have the ability to um, produce things that subtractive can't do regardless. There are things that additive can do that subtractive um, technologies can't do. So from a, a true um, tool standpoint, um, there are things that the additive enables from a designer's um, flexibility mindset that are literally impossible to subtractive. So that's one of those things of why do I have to do it? Because if you don't have it, you're missing, so to speak, the ability to make some unique parts, whether it's, hey, I'm going to take these four parts and I'm gonna make them as one part. In other words, re reduce the number of uh, SKUs as we call it, or active part numbers through um, additive technology or the, the, the general shape because you can't cast it, you can't forge it. That's impossible because the, the mold doesn't come apart in that direction. Um, or the idea that it has, it's hollow. So there, there are things that simply you just can't do unless you have additive as a tool. Terry, thanks. Appreciate, uh, appreciate your insight. Um, look, we're, uh, we're a minute past time. I want to respect your time frame and your day. Um, Charlotte just sent me a note and said what we're going to do. We're going to, uh, capture these, um, additional open questions send them out to yourself um, and me and Mark Morris and Dana can respond and uh, we can uh, do that. That would be great. And I hope that's sufficient for the audience that's on the line. Uh, but look, uh, Terry, always good to see you, man. Good thanks to see you. Uh, and thanks for the partnership. We appreciate your business and uh, look forward to seeing you here soon. Yeah, I hope it was uh, worthwhile for participants on the phone. Um, again, uh, um, Thank you for your time and thank you for, like I said, it was definitely a partnership and a growth together. So thank you guys and, uh, and have a good day. Yep. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Terry. Bye.